Well, good evening, everyone. That, that worked, didn't it? <laughs> uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Gillian Siegel, and I'm the chairman. I have the privilege, actually, of being the chairman of the General Sir John Monash Foundation. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you all tonight. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And it's a treat to see so many friends, very special friends indeed, here tonight for what promises to be a highly engaging oration by a leading Australian and one of the Foundation's dear friends and supporters, Kim Williams, AM, Chair of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Kim, thank you so much for agreeing to do this year's oration. We're honoured and the timing could not be more interesting to consider leadership in the media. And you are an ideal person to give us your views and to lead the debate. Can I also acknowledge Zeli Hagar, a wonderful 2010 scholar who is here also, um, who's a leading barrister in Sydney and who will be giving the uh, comment in reply. Zeli, thank you also for agreeing to do this. So with more than 100 of you, it's not possible to mention everyone because you really are all special friends and supporters and we would not be here without your support. But can I just acknowledge a few people who've made this possible? Andrew Hinchliffe, um, the Group Executive Institutional Banking and Markets at the Commonwealth Bank, whom we'll hear from uh, shortly. But thank you, Andrew, for all your support. Nick Greiner, AC, former Premier of New South Wales and uh, former Australian Consul General in New York, who, when I've been to New York, has been a very generous host to John Monash scholars in New York. Um, and I have given them a thrill, I think, to uh, to always be together and uh, to see uh, how Australian Consul Generals live <laughs> in style. <laughs> and work. Sorry, and work. <laughs> Um, Matt Keane, former Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party in New South Wales, the Honourable P Patricia Forsyth, Chancellor of the University of Newcastle, Mark Scott, Professor Mark Scott, Vice-Chancellor and President of the University of Sydney, Professor Merlin Crossley, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of UNSW Sydney, Warwick Shanks, Deputy Chancellor of the University of Wollongong, Professor Jennifer Milam, Pro Vice-Chancellor of the University of Newcastle, Liz Hughes, CEO of NIDA, Christine Stasi, a wonderful supporter for many years, Group Executive for People, Performance and Reputation at IAG, but who used to uh, host us also at CBA. Dr Stuart Gill, Master of Queen's College, University of Melbourne, Gary Brown, uh, Chairman of Stuart Alexander, and Foundation supporters, Vera Boyarski and Michael Gannon. Um, can I also thank special guests at the Commonwealth Bank, leaders from the Whitlam Institute, members of the Foundation's Chairman's Circle, board members, John Monash scholars, members of the media, and friends all. Thank you, thank you all for being supporters and coming this evening. Can I just have another special thank you to Andrew Hinchliffe and the Commonwealth Bank for once again hosting us at a very special event, which is our signature event in the year. The Commonwealth Bank has hosted the annual John Monash Oration since 2014, which is a wonderful partnership. And our partnership with the bank goes back to 2003, our very beginning. It includes funding for John Monash scholarships as well as other things such as this oration. So, so far, 14 Commonwealth Bank John Monash scholars have been appointed. And we're very fortunate to have two of them with us this evening, Dr. Vafa Garzavi, the 2017 Commonwealth Bank Scholar, who studied a doctorate in public policy at the University of Oxford and has been the Executive Director of Research and Policy at the James Martin Institute, and Hugo Rourke, who's just recently back, um, the 2023 Commonwealth Bank Scholar, who just returned from a mid-career Master's in Public Administration at Harvard. So before I hand over to Andrew, can I just give you a few updates on the foundation? We have copies of our annual report on the table and elsewhere, I think it was outside if you're interested. Um, but it it's, continues to be such an amazing ride, I think, and we've been so fortunate um, with the team that's around us, uh, with our wonderful CEO, Paul Ramage, thank you, uh, steering us this last year on a very exciting journey. 
Um, we now have 264 John Minor scholars. Uh, that's a considerable number when you think we started with zero only 20 years ago. 57 still studying, 69 who've completed and are still building networks and uh, working overseas, and 138 who have returned and already making significant contributions as scientists, academics, artists, business leaders, entrepreneurs, lawyers, doctors, policy experts, etc. So we have people in politics, we have leading members of the bar, uh, we have change makers in every field. So taken as a whole, the scholars are really a talent bank for the nation. We're currently underway with our selection process for the 2025 scholars, which involves dozens of leading Australians, some of you here, thank you, sitting on selection panels in every state and territory. And I'm pleased to say that more Australians than ever are applying to us for a scholarship and they want to study a broader range of issues at a broader range of leading overseas universities. So that is, I think, a great accomplishment, that spread uh, and a, a ever more interesting cohort of scholars. And our strategy has always been and continues to be nationally supported, nationally celebrated, representing the best of Australia. So we're deeply appreciative that in this last 12-month period, both Queensland, the Queensland Government and the Western Australian Government have provided perpetual John Monash scholarships uh, into our endowment to have a Queensland scholar and a WA scholar, matching commitments by New South Wales, Victoria and the Commonwealth. So these governments stand beside very far thinking companies such as the Commonwealth Bank, BHP, West Farmers and Rio Tinto and an impressive group of individuals making up the chairman's circle, foundations and trusts giving us confidence that the foundation is doing exactly what we set out to do, supported proudly by Australians from all walks of life, building up um, from you know, civil society to deliver outstanding people for the future of Australia and indeed the world. We have one or two who are doing it out there in the world. We want most of them back in Australia, but we're happy to donate a few to the betterment of mankind. In essence, the scholarships are Australia's own postgraduate ones, preparing the leaders of tomorrow, lifting our relatively young country up to the standards of more mature nations, and some would say exceeding those standards. So we've just completed delivering a highly successful John Monash leadership series, featuring five impressive Australian leaders being interviewed by John Monash scholars. And one of these, Mark's, Professor Mark Scott from the University of Sydney is with us tonight. So thank you, Mark for helping us deliver that series. And if any of you are interested in seeing it, if you missed it, um, we have video highlights and podcasts from that series on our website. It's the Foundation's privilege to be in this unique position of building a community of outstanding Australians and who we think will be the change makers and leaders of the future. And as I said, it couldn't be done without our partners, um, our uh, corporate partners and our individual partners, and a wonderful volunteer base um, of individuals who sit on our selection panels. And again, thank you to those who are busy in the thick of it at the moment, um, our CEO and our management team. But can I also thank CBA um, and the CBA's team for doing uh, putting this, this event on, because it doesn't happen uh, as with a click of a finger. Unfortunately, a lot of work goes into it, and we really do appreciate it, so thank you. So now let me introduce a current leader and a great friend of the Foundation's, Andrew Hinchliffe. So Andrew became the Commonwealth Bank's Group Executive Institutional Banking and Markets in August 2018. He joined the bank in 2015 as Executive General Manager Global Markets, and after more than 15 years in global institutional banking and market roles with Goldman Sachs and earlier at Credit Suisse First Boston. And he's responsible for leading the Commonwealth Bank's relationships with major corporates and government clients. And he has been a wonderful supporter of the foundation. And um, I'd like you to put your hands together to welcome and to thank Andrew.
you, thank you, Gillian, um, for those very kind words and opening. And um, thank you for all of your personal commitment to the foundation, uh, as well as the entire uh, John Monash team uh, over the years. It's been a privilege to be associated with the foundation. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land which we meet to this evening, the, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging. Um, and welcome to the, the 13th annual Sir General John Monash Foundation oration. Um, as, as you heard from Gillian, the Commonwealth Bank has been uh, a partner for the foundation since 2004, and we're extremely proud of our association with the foundation that is now coming up for, for near uh, two decades. Um, the foundation uh, itself um, fosters the talents of extraordinary young Australians uh, who have the potential to deliver um, you know, significant value and achievements in their chosen field as well as to the country more generally and uh, hopefully deliver outcomes that will inspire a new generation of, of trailblazers and young leaders that this country so desperately needs. Um, the, this will be the 14th uh, CBA scholarship uh, that we've sponsored. We've, we've provided scholarships across uh, disciplines inclu including economics and law, engineering, science, public policy, uh, as well as sustainability. And uh, we're always extremely excited to see those uh, scholars go on to achieve, you know, great things and significant things in their chosen field uh, that ultimately benefits the society in general. And um, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker uh, this evening, uh, Mr. Kim Williams. And. Uh, uh, Mr. Williams has been uh, had a long and established and esteemed career in the media arts and entertainment industry over a long period of time, occupying executive leadership positions, including uh, the chief executive for News Corp Australia, uh, Foxtel, as well as the Australian Film Commission. Uh, in 2007, he was appointed uh, a member of the Order of Australia um, for services to the arts industry. Um, and then in January 2024, uh, six months ago, it was appointed to the chair of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC. And in that capacity uh, has been an advocate for the ABC, including for funding uh, for Australia's most um, reliable and trustworthy news source. So I think given tonight's um, topic uh, being uh, the role of media in our communities, I could hardly think of anyone more suited uh, or more capable of, of talking to this topic and giving us his insights on uh, one of the really important pillars in, in today's society. And so please join me in welcoming to the stage, Mr. Kim Williams. Thank you, Andrew. And um, I associate myself with the acknowledgement of country by Gillian and Andrew. Um, it's my great honour to be here today as the chair of one of Australia's most important institutions, or to be more precise, one of Australia's most important democratic institutions, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. That's how I regard the ABC, not simply as a TV, radio and online network, but as a central component of Australian democracy. All of us here today are serious people. We watch the news, we try to interpret the times, the state of democracy around the world is often in our minds. Suddenly, it appears more fragile than we once thought. Locked in a battle, in places literally, with nasty authoritarian forms of populism. The survival depends on us and what we do. Citizens need to understand this worrisome phenomenon. Building that understanding needs reportage, analysis, commentary, discussion, and strong informed leadership. That battle between democracy and populism is often a contest between the truth and lies, because where there is no truth, there is no democracy. Truth is the oil that makes the machinery of freedom work. This matters in every sense. Countries where the truth triumphs are richer, happier, and freer. Even in the recent tally of medals in the Olympics, populations of the USA and China aside, it was the advanced democracies that performed so demonstrably well because they celebrate and support meritocracy. 
Remove truth and you get a screaming match that creates and channels anger and hatred. People yelling past each other, claiming that walls can keep enemies out, that drinking bleach can cure COVID, that everything that's going wrong with our nation, our society and our own lives is someone else's fault and must be avenged. Decisions based on untruths, stuff that is merely made up, is a recipe for policy disaster. In some ways, the man we honour this evening, General Sir John Monash, provides a lesson in the need for the truth and reason to guide our decisions. Monash was a man who built his reputation on bringing reason to bear on fact-based realities, an engineer, a general. Just as an engineer, he built bridges using the laws of physics. As a general, he built victories on the cold logic of battle. And like all truly great engineers, he was open to new materials, new technologies, and new forms of organisation. He didn't suffer foolish plans that were based on pride, emotion, and hope. In some ways, he invented modern warfare. The most accomplished of his contemporaries and military historians alike have said he was the greatest, most thorough and most imaginative general of the First World War, something provide, proved by masterminding of the most decisive battle of that war, the Battle of Amiens, which, after, after which his opposite number, General Ludendorff, declared the war was effectively over. Reason, facts, logic. These things drove his decisions. The Australian core was in good hands indeed. And yet he had contemporaries who based their decisions on the logic of prejudice and populism, and they did not like Monash. Seldom has a great Australian been subjected to such calumnies. In June 1918, as the Allied forces had begun to repulse the German spring offensive, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig decided to appoint Monash, then head of the Australian 3rd Division, as head of the Australian Corps. Monash's credentials for the position had been demonstrated by his recapture of villers bretonneux the first great setback for Ludendorff's desperate gamble, rightly now a famous battle honour for our nation. But two men who thought their opinions were more important weren't convinced. <coughs> War correspondent Charles Bean and journalist Keith Murdoch saw things differently and began a campaign to convince Prime Minister Billy Hughes to intervene and give the battlefield command to Major General Brudenell White instead. They began a lobbying campaign on the lie that Monash's peers didn't rate him. It was out and out nonsense, a disinformation campaign which collapsed when Prime Minister Billy Hughes, touring the front line, was told repeatedly the exact opposite, that Monash had the esteem of all who worked with him. Beans and Murdoch's folly was a great example of the idiocy of spreading fake news and of basing decisions on prejudice and ego. As Monash's biographer, Geoffrey Sewell, so aptly put it, to have distracted Australia's higher commanders during some of the most vital days of the war, it is perhaps the outstanding case of sheer irresponsibility by press men in Australian history. Monash later gained the grudging respect of Bean, but Murdoch's strange enmity lived on in his barely explicable opposition to Monash's favoured design for the Melbourne Shrine of Remembrance, against which his newspaper, The Herald, waged a relentless campaign. The Tomb of Gloom, Heath Murdoch's newspapers called it, painting it as an elitist project that they wanted replaced with a square and cenotaph at the top of Burke Street. His cheap populist campaign almost succeeded. Thank God it didn't. Without Monash's leadership, the epic solemn shrine that remains a source of reverence and pride to all Victorians may have been lost, replaced by something decidedly utilitarian and pedestrian. In both of these controversies, had populism triumphed over evidence, 
history would have been different and we the poorer. The Allies' brilliant offensive may not have broken the Hindenburg Line so easily in October of 1918. Many more may have died as, as a result, and Melbourne may have been robbed of one of the most imposing, sacred and city-defining architectural treasures. After his great victories, Monash went on to grace Victorian and Australian society for just another 13 years before his death, aged just 66, in 1931. His life was a resounding victory for integrity and a signal defeat for racism and authoritarianism at a time when such dark and anti-democratic forces were gathering real pace in Europe. One of his greatest achievements was not succumbing to hubris. Like the noblest characters of classical times, he ignored calls to enter politics, overthrow the Scullin government and establish himself as some sort of dictator. They were strange times. Interestingly, the man he defeated in 1918, General Eric Ludendorff, wasn't as wise. His dictatorial ambitions helped undermine the Weimar Republic and pave the way for Hitler and eventually the Holocaust. How fortunate were we to have a Monash and not a Ludendorff? It has been said that by contrast, Monash's achievements made the spread of anti-Semitism in Australia impossible. Our diggers wouldn't hear a word against him. <clears throat> Pardon me. That alone should cause us to remember him as one of the truly great Australians. So why is remembering Monash in this way still important? Most directly, I would say that in a world of multiplying Ludendorffs, we need more Monashes. The Monash scholars present today are next generation thinkers and leaders for this nation at a crucial time in world affairs. Monash demonstrated in his own life the fr that, that freedom's triumph depends on each of us, our leadership, our integrity, the individual decisions we each make to put the country above personal ambition, our fidelity to democracy over populism, our commitment to reason and truth over irrationalism and lies, and the importance of being open always to innovation and progress. Excuse me. <laughs> I got very bad asthma and hay fever walking over from the ABC this evening. So I apologise. For those of us in the media, the implication is clear. Our duty is to show people that the truth can survive and still be discerned in a world of multiplying fake news, bigotry and populist opinion. We must make democratic politics based on the exercise of reason, once again, the norm. In practical terms, it means creating a trusted source of news to provide the fuel that sustains our democracy. I'm guessing many of you are ardent podcast listeners. I certainly am. One of my favourites at present is The Rest is Politics, with Alastair Campbell and Rory Stewart. Something they have been discussing recently is the need for trusted sources of news to combat the global rise of anti-democratic populist movements that spread hatred and lies. Fascinatingly, one person warning against this was J.D. Vance, who wrote in his 2016 mem memoir, Hillbilly Elegy, that only 6% of American voters believe that the media was very trustworthy. They, he wrote, they know that the mainstream media frequently exposes right-wing conspiracy theories as nonsense. It's just that they don't care. They believe what they want to believe. This, Vance writes, isn't some libertarian mistrust of government policy, which is healthy in any democracy. This is deep scepticism of the very institutions of our society, and it's becoming more and more mainstream. One wonders how far Mr Vance has changed his views in the eight years since he published that, but on the crucial point, he is correct. The very institutions of our society are losing the public's trust, in large part because there is no longer a broad consensus about the facts. 
We saw an example of the damage lies can cause in the ugly riots that spread across cities in England and Northern Ireland recently. Fake news. Some of it Russian disinformation. All of it enabled by the new media world in which we live. As a recent Guardian editorial said, our media landscape, which is symbiotically linked to politics, has both raised the temperature of civic life and created forums for destructive anti-democratic impulses to coalesce in new ways. And as artificial intelligence becomes more sophisticated, this sort of thing is likely to become more common. Mark Zuckerberg recently predicted that there would soon be billions of personalised AI assistants producing content for the world, exactly the sort of invented content responsible for these violent xenophobic riots in the UK. Like you, I'm sure, this worries me. In the face of all this, the contest for liberal democracy is now a battle to establish the primacy of the truth. The truth unites, lies divide. The truth builds social cohesion, lies create social confusion. And democracy has to respond by getting better at spreading the truth everywhere. We have to bridge the divides between classes, cultures, genders and communities, creating richer, better quality news content and disseminating it across the entirety of our nation city and country getting the same high quality of service. This is getting harder. Across the world, leading trusted news media are battling to remain viable as their revenues are captured by tech companies and their audiences are taken by TikTok, YouTube, Insta, Facebook and myriad others. According to the latest survey of 47 countries by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford, Across the globe, the percentage of people getting their news from online platforms rather than media publishers is steadily increasing. It's now at 72% compared to 22% only a few years ago. The revenue costs are stingingly severe. A sorry, a sorry tale of layoffs and closures, emptying newsrooms and defunct mastheads. Regional and rural media has been particularly hard hit. The result is the accelerating breakdown of social cohesion and the creation of the increasingly divided, coarsened, intolerant and violent world we now inhabit. As chairman of the ABC, as well as the Reuters news agency trustees, I understand the economic pressures global news gathering is under to maintain its quality, diversity, and vital importance. What can we do here in Australia? Because the same forces undermining newsrooms across the world are at work here too. In 2023, newspaper revenue was 4.4% below that of 2019. Television advertising revenue was down 10% on the previous year. And broadcast radio advertising revenue was down 4% on the previous year. Online advertising now accounts for more than half of all advertising revenue in Australia, with two thirds of that going to just two players, Google and Facebook. And while digital subscriptions for our news media are growing, they are not keeping up with readership and revenue losses. As a result, the number of newspaper journalists almost halved between 2011 and 2023. The number of regional news outlets is in even more, a more dire state of decay, especially in Queensland. This situation, this situation hasn't been helped by Meta's declaration in March that it was closing its Australian news partnership team and not entering new commercial deals with news organisations currently worth more than $70 million annually. Together with Google, these agreements have to date contributed $200 million per year to help keep newsrooms afloat. Meta's decision is accelerating an already rapid diminishment of newsrooms with severe, even savage cuts at Nine, News Corp and Seven West. The axe keeps swinging and every time it falls, the truth and democracy suffer a blow. The ways people consume news, information and entertainment are altering at startling rates. 
Since 2011, broadcast television's reach has fallen by a third, from just over 90% to just under 62%. Radio listeners are consuming nearly a quarter less per week than they were a dozen years ago. The Financial Times recently reported that for the first time ever, less than half of 16 to 24-year-olds in the UK tuned into regular broadcast services in an average week, down from more than three quarters in 2018. Even young children aged 4 to 15 are moving online. Only 55% of them are watching broadcast television in an average week, compared to 81% six years ago. Where are these viewers and listeners going? Increasingly to social media. They're curating their own viewing, getting their news from many user-generated sources, including YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and increasingly TikTok. According to the Pew Research Centre, a third of Americans aged between 18 and 29 are regularly getting their news from TikTok. Journalists trained in media eth ethics are often being sidelined in favour of the views and values from unknown strangers. And increasingly, content is being created using no journalists at all. AI is now an active generator of produced news. You don't have to be a Luddite to worry about what this may mean for the truth and for democracy if it is not within editorial guardrails. It is silly to stand in the way of innovation. However, we need to know that what is produced can be trusted. Already, the Reuters Institute study reports that just 40% of respondents say that they trust most news. This is down from 50% in 2018. Younger, poorer and less educated people tend to trust news less. There is little difference between left and right. The most disengaged citizens trust the media the least. What this survey does suggest is that the top trust factors were high journalistic standards at 80% and transparency at 81%. The survey also stated that at 64%, trust in the ABC was significantly ahead of any other news source in Australia. People trust the ABC because we earn their trust through our professionalism and objectivity and observe standards of public accountability. These characteristics should be a feature of ABC content wherever it is found, whether it's on our television, radio or digital platforms, or indeed on social media providers where the ABC will go to seek out and deliver to new audiences. We need to do all we can as, as a nation to reinvest in the sources of truth, newsrooms and documentary production, because truth and knowledge aren't optional extras for Australian democracy. They're essential to it. They're the antidote to fake news. New ideas are needed to restore the commercial health of our commercial newsrooms. It's my hope that they succeed. Nine, seven news corps the smaller independent players like Schwartz and Crikey, all are vital parts of our democracy. The ABC is not in opposition to commercial newsrooms. We are in an alliance with them to create an informed democratic citizenry, an alliance of complementary viewpoints and emphases that together provide the basis for a sound democratic debate. The commercial broadcasters can be helped by good government policy something I'm sure we all strongly support. Sadly, recent attempts, like the agreements with Meta to ensure advertising revenues are shared fairly with content providers, haven't totally succeeded. But we can't give up. Occam's razor suggests the most obvious and direct way to strengthen Australian news services is to invest more in the most trusted source of news in the country, the ABC. It has, after all, suffered severe funding declines for way too long. To put it in perspective, going back 40 years, if government indexation had applied, the decline is just under half a billion dollars. If we look at just the last 12 years, even after allowing for the Albanese government's restitution of the Morrison government cuts, the decline is 13.7% 
in real terms. No media organisation in the world could possibly endure such protracted neglect, eventual decline in its geographical reach, production quality and general news standards. If we are serious about improving the ABC, its flaws must be acknowledged. However, I believe the ABC is a, is a capable, vital contributor to the thought landscape and will be so even more with better investment. The journalists are capable of remarkable work. They have demonstrated it time and time again. And in turn, Australians are capable of almost anything. My intention, one I sense has the instinctive support of Australia's citizens, is to inject new life, new pride, new purpose and higher intellectual intent into the news, discussion and documentary side of the ABC. I extend this to serious drama too, because serious drama focuses citizens on the big vital issues of the times, gets them discussing, arguing, seeing things from new angles and recognising what they have in common. Great drama has, of course, done that since the invention of theatre in classical Athens. Only real effort to up the energy of serious journalism and reach out to the majority wherever they live, whatever their level of education, can give us the level of re-engagement in democratic debate that we so crucially need. We live in interesting, some may say dangerous, times. Political upheaval, war in Europe, worrisome conflict in the Middle East, geopolitical uncertainty in Asia, Africa, and the Pacific, climate change, people movement, roiling culture wars. I don't think there is enough serious factual debate and reporting going on to inform the Australian people across these vital issues and to counter the increasing levels of sometimes intentional disinformation being created around them. We have to provide it and make it accessible. What can be done? The first thing is a recommitment to objectivity. On this subject, let me encourage you to read the recent book, Collisions of Power, Trump, Bezos and the Washington Post, by someone I know and admire, the famed American newspaper editor, Martin Barron, a leader worthy of Monash's mission. Marty Barron, as you probably know, was the creator of the renowned investigation team at the Boston Globe which some of you may have seen in the 2015 movie Spotlight. His memoir covers so many fascinating aspects of running contemporary media organisations that it probably should be considered compulsory reading for today's media executives, maybe for any executive. One of the subjects he takes on is the declining commitment to the principle of journalistic objectivity that he encountered during his time rebuilding the Washington Post following its purchase by Bezos. Having grown up in a world of ubiquitous social media and identity politics, some of Barron's younger journalists were starting to regard themselves not as objective reporters, but as activists and partisans. Angry at the glaring inequalities in American society, swept up in the Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements, they wanted to put aside staid notions about staying above the fray and to enlist their newspaper in the cause. This caused serious headaches at the Washington Post and it also did famously at the New York Times and other US news media. Tempting as it is to want to take sides, I think all of us in the media and cultural institutions generally must resist. As Barron puts it, the journalistic profession's traditional ethics standards have been fashioned with one overriding idea. How can news organisations earn the public's trust? I think Barron is right. Trust is the crucial issue. Once the media compromises its absolute commitment to the truth, how can people be expected to trust what it reports? How can anyone be certain about any fact? How can they safely put any faith in their leaders? How can they believe something as straightforward as who won an election? How can the peaceful handover of power be guaranteed? 
To put it another way, when the truth is relative, democracy is imperiled. In my view, objectivity must never be compromised in any media organisation, especially in a publicly owned one like the ABC. I'm already on the record of calling for a renewal of Radio National. Its current audience is comparatively small, but its potential importance is huge. I see it as a source of future leadership for celebrating and interrogating intellectual and creative life in Australia. A flagship, if you like, an exemplar of high standards and intellectual intent for the rest of the ABC and the nation to follow. Much the same role that Radio 4 plays at the BBC. Let me be clear, Radio National will remain a broadcast platform but there is no doubt audiences will increasingly enjoy the deep catalogue of debates and ideas it hosts in on-demand um, environments as audiences evolve and as our digital audio platform, ABC Listen, continues to grow. The Australian Financial Review, a paper I read and admire, has had a great slogan over the years, the daily habit of successful people. I want listening to Radio National and its podcast to become the ha daily habit of thinking engaged and well-informed citizens. The same should go for local and regional radio, as well as ABC TV news, current affairs and serious documentary, children's and education programs, and our key digital platforms, ABC News, ABC iView and ABC Listen. In summary, in every area of the ABC, we need ambition, ambition and more ambition. The goal is to create a distinctive ABC voice and ethos with all parts of the organisation recognisable for their integrity, aspiration and high standards. While the ABC Charter makes clear that the ABC should balance programmes of wide appeal and specialised interest, I think the ABC needs to manage the difficult balance between push and pull in programming for a wide diversity of Australians, whilst always aiming for the highest standards in all that it undertakes. The ABC I chair will always respect the intelligence of its audience and our pursuit of the best journalistic standards will be second to none. Our future lies in taking the high road to reliable, durable quality. This is the direction that will give the ABC a sense of purpose, that will remake it as one of the most important institutions of our democracy. It is, after all, the mirror, the camera and the microphone of the nation. I want all who work for the ABC, who support the ABC and who have responsibility for investing in the ABC to recognise its vital role in our democracy and to be infused with a spirit of positivity and optimism about Australia and its future. Right now, the ABC is in the Australian front line of the contest for global liberal, liberal democracy and its values. As Sir John Man Monash managed to do in, the, in 1918, this is another fight Australian democracy must, and I believe will, win. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, I'm sure you'll all agree there were some extremely articulate remarks, I think, of you know one of the defining issues of our time. And uh, I expect a wall of questions to come when we do Q&A uh, in about 10 minutes after I uh, introduce our, our next guest, um, Zeli Heger. Um, so Zeli is a 2010 John Munnar Scholar. Um, she uh, has graduated um, from the University of Sydney with a, a Bachelor of Law. Uh, she went on to get the University of Medal as well as uh, topping uh, the aggregate marks uh, for the bar exam. Um, you know, subsequent to that, she went on to do a Master's of Law at Cambridge University, supported by the John Monash Scholarship Foundation. Um, you know, since graduating, uh, she's contributed an enormous amount to her field, uh, where she was an associate for the Chief Justice of the High Court and Chief Justice of the Federal Court. 
Um, she has uh, appeared uh, in some you know, uh, high profile ICAC inquiries uh, within New South Wales, and she has uh, set up a practice um, in commercial and public law uh, within uh, 11 Wentworth firm, uh, where she currently is practicing. So please join me uh, in welcoming our next speaker, Sally Heger. Thank you very much. Tim, Andrew, Gillian, distinguished guests, scholars, friends and supporters of the John Monash Foundation. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathering tonight and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Thank you, Kim, for those inspiring words about General Sir John Monash and also the importance of the media to our system of government and our very way of life. The media is not something we can take for granted. We need to invest in it to ensure it continues to be a beacon of truth and knowledge in the face of disinformation and irrationality. As you've heard, I've occupied a number of different positions in the law. I've practised as a barrister here in Sydney for the last 11 years. My clients have included Commonwealth and state governments, public institutions, including the ABC, as well as international corporations and private individuals. Prior to that, I worked for two Chief Justices, as you've heard, uh, worked at the Crown Solicitor's Office for a time and did a brief stint at the Commonwealth Attorney General's Department working on the National Human Rights Consultation. And with thanks to the General Sir John Monash Foundation, I undertook a Master's in Law at Cambridge in 2010, where I studied human rights law. So tonight, I want to touch on a few of the themes that Kim has mentioned, but from a lawyer's perspective. And I believe there is a symbiotic relationship between the media and the law. In ways that I'll explain, the media promotes the rule of law, and the law promotes and protects the media. Kim has addressed the importance of the media to our system of democracy and, of course, one aspect of that system is the rule of law, the idea that no person, no government is above the law and uh, a breach of the law resulting consequences. And the media can have both a positive and negative effect on the rule of law. The positive dimension is this, the media promotes accountability, exposing when a government is not abiding by the own laws, the laws that it has made. This requires, of course, the media to be independent of government. It requires protections for the media's sources of information and protection from legal action that might prevent them from reporting in the public interest. By way of example, the law of defamation has evolved to serve that end, although different views might be taken as to the extent to which it has achieved that end. Where a media organisation is sued for defamation, it's of course a defence if they show they were reporting the substantial truth, which is a defence that succeeded for Channel 10, of course, in the proceedings brought by Mr Lerman. Or they can rely on the defence of qualified privilege, that there was a public interest in reporting on the issue and that it was reasonable to do so in the circumstances. The media also has a role in educating the public about the law. So I recently appeared in a case brought by Ms Tickle, a transgender woman, uh, against a social networking app called Giggle for Girls, which was designed to be exclusively for women. And Ms Tickle succeeded in her claim for gender identity discrimination against Giggle. Uh, the court found it had broken the law by excluding her on the grounds of her transgender status. Now, that judgment was widely reported in the media, and that meant that the court's judgment, which was a first in this area of gender identity discrimination, could have an educative effect beyond the two parties to the proceedings and beyond the lawyers who might have a specific interest in that area of law. It ended up having a much broader reach. But the media's impact on the rule of law can also be negative when it's used in the wrong way. 
So to take a hypothetical and general example, say a court upholds the rights of an unpopular minority group, a section of the media criticises the decision without proper analysis and exaggerates its consequences, it turns into a political issue, a topic for shock jocks, responsive laws are rushed through Parliament to take the heat out of the situation. And that's not a good policy response. That undermines the rule of law. And in that scenario, the media would shoulder part of the blame. So those are a few ways in which the media and the law intersect from my perspective. Next, I want to ask, what are the characteristics that are essential to the media's role as a source of truth and knowledge and which are vital to ensuring it can play this important role in our democracy? Kim mentioned the need for objectivity, and it's important for institutions like the ABC to maintain that objectivity so that it can maintain the trust of the Australian people. A related concept is impartiality, which is also an important concept in the legal world. So a judge is supposed to be impartial when deciding a case and a barrister is to be impartial as well in the sense that we're supposed to leave our own personal and political views aside when we decide whether we can take on a case and in deciding how we run it. Barristers' job, of course, is to put the best argument they can for their client consistently with their professional obligations to ensure the court can make uh, a well-informed decision and that justice is done. And there's a parallel in some ways to the media here. Likewise, the media is there to present different sides of the argument, different perspectives, to ensure the public can reach an informed view on the best available information. Now, of course, that does not mean the media is required to give all sides of an argument equal airtime, no matter how irrational or unreasoned they might be. So what does impartiality mean then exactly in the media context? Well, the ABC's editorial policy refers to the concept of due impartiality. So it involves a balance that follows the weight of the evidence, fair treatment, open-mindedness and opportunities over time for principal relevant perspectives on matters of contention to be expressed. So impartiality does not require that every perspective receives equal time, nor that every facet of every argument is presented, because the balance follows the weight of the evidence. In the current climate, the concept of impartiality has been tested. So Kim referred to the example of Barron's younger journalists who, in an age of social media and identity politics, were starting to regard themselves as activists or partisans. Barron resisted those urges, as I'm sure the ABC will too. But what of the many who, with the assistance of the internet and social media, can self-publish without the constraints of journalistic ethics? Some of these self-publishers do take sides. They consciously and overtly challenge their own channel, their own culture, background and world view. They see it as their role to do so. And that is a potentially concerning phenomenon because, as we've heard, more people are now getting their news from social media and other online sources. Now, does that mean the concept of impartiality needs to be updated? to account for this phenomenon or jettisoned altogether? The answer must be no. These voices, of course, cannot and should not be silenced. They have their place. But their voices must be balanced by authoritative, impartial, trusted sources like the ABC and other news organisations. And that's why it's so important for news organisations to have a presence on social media and why viewers must be educated with the skills and awareness to be able to tell an authoritative source from one that is not. So what can be done to ensure that the media remains a bastion of truth and knowledge? As we've heard, funding and investment is one important part of the puzzle. 
From a lawyer's perspective, I'm also interested in the ability of their law to address these issues. Kim's referred to the multi-million dollar deal struck between Google and Facebook on the one hand and media organisations on the other, which essentially involved uh, Google and Facebook paying news organisations for the right to display uh, their news content on their platforms. Now, those deals came about as a result of a law passed by federal parliament. And that law is a fascinating study in the power of the law to shape the media market. The legislation gave the government the power to designate a digital platform, such as Google or Facebook, and upon designation, they would become subject to the news media bargaining code. Upon designation, the digital platform would be required to negotiate with news organisations, pay them a fee for displaying their news, and if they couldn't reach an agreement, uh, they risked compulsory arbitration. Now, the funny thing is, no designation was ever actually made. And so the code was never enlivened. But it was the mere threat of being designated that was seemingly enough to encourage the key digital players to get on the front foot and conclude agreements with news organisations to reach an outcome that was mutually acceptable. Now, as you've heard, Meta has announced that it will not be renewing those agreements, uh, but at least for a time, the law had the desired effect. And whether or not you agree with uh, the government's policy response in that instance, and maybe that's a topic for another day, it's a clear example of how the law can have a profound impact on the media landscape. And there are other legal options being explored. So, for example, in 2019, the government asked the major digital platforms to develop a code of practice on disinformation and misinformation. The code is voluntary, but ACMA monitors compliance with the code and reports about it to government. Last year, the government engaged in a consultation process on a draft bill to strengthen ACMA's powers in this regard to deal with misinformation and disinformation on digital platforms. It would enable ACMA to register and enforce a code of practice and, if it deemed the code ineffective, uh, for ACMA to make its own standard on the topic. Of course, it will be important to strike the right balance between uh, addressing objectively untrue content on the one hand and freedom of expression on the other. And I'll leave others to debate whether the bill does that or not, but it's another example of the potential impact of the law on the media landscape. But of course, laws can only go so far. In my view, another important piece of the response must come through education. As a parent of school-aged children, so far I've managed to keep my kids away from social media, but I realise that won't be possible forever. And so in my view, it's crucial that children be educated in the benefits and risks of social media and trained to detect authoritative and trustworthy sources of news from those that are not. And this should start early because children are being exposed to social media at an alarmingly young age. And the ABC has also played a role in this endeavour, being a member of the Australian Media Literary Alliance and producing literacy content for general audiences as well as school-aged children with items on explaining the news, questioning the media and tips for teachers, which is important work. In these various ways, funding, regulatory intervention and education, we can protect the integrity of our media, we can slow the rate of truth decay and the media's important role in our democracy and our justice system can be preserved. A fundamental principle of that system is that justice should not only be done, but should be seen to be done. And for that to occur, a strong and independent media is vital. Thank you, Zelly. We're, we're going to do maybe uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. I invite Zelly and 
him back to the stage. Um, well, thank you very much. Extremely uh, interesting topic. Um, we've got a couple of roving mics uh, through the back of the room. So I see if there's a question in the room. First and foremost, pick it off. I don't know. Going down the front left there, I feel like an option here. There we go. Thanks. Kim, you have talked about objectivity and raising standards and all that sort of stuff, which is terrific. As an old bloke of 70, I think that's great. But I'm not your target market in that regard. So I'm I'm wondering, you can do a fabulous job, but still not engage with the next generations. So how are you going to bridge that gap? Um, <clears throat> earlier today, um, we, we had a gathering of the, the 100 senior um, leaders at the, a at the ABC, people who work across all of the content domains and, and some of the... Um, management and administrative support personnel and that exact question came up and um, I expressed a personal view um, which is something that I challenge people to think about but I think if you expect to address an audience that let's say is aged between 20 and 26 you better not be 50 years old <laughs> That you need to actually empower 28 year olds and mentor them in order to do that. Um, a very good friend of mine is Mark Thompson, who was the Director General of the BBC for many years. He was the Managing Director of Channel 4 for a number of years. Um, he was the head of the Panorama documentary strand of the BBC eons ago, and then more recently became the managing director of the New York Times and reinvented the New York Times and in many ways rescued it commercially. And he's now been appointed as the editor-in-chief and president of CNN. Um, and Mark said some years ago of digital technologies and of young audiences. What we have to have the courage to do is to just put at the disposal of young people enormously expensive, unprecedentedly powerful technologies and mentor, mentor them until they can, almost can't bear it because it's the only way that we can actually rescue the communication fabric that reflects the sort of values that matter at the BBC and the New York Times. That, I think that was a statement of absolute truth. I think since Mark left the BBC, it's been less, um, it's had less of an appetite for doing that. Certainly at the New York Times, it's been amazingly successful. Now, in terms of humanity, the New York Times deals in small numbers. I think they'll, they'll probably pass eight, nine million subscribers in the space of the next, next year or two. That's a lot of subscribers, incidentally, in comparison with when Mark went in. I think it had about one and a half million then. But in terms of the the enormity of the population, it's a, it's a small number. But I think the principle and the statement was utterly correct. Any other questions? Another one down the front table. Kim, both you and Zali talked about the importance of the independence of our institutions. And I look across at the United States and Mr. Trump is threatening to get rid of Chairman Powell when he comes to office. He's clearly politicised the Supreme Court over there. 
And even in Australia, we've had discussions about the independence of our Reserve Bank over the last couple of days. How confident are you in the independence of the ABC? Do we have sufficient safeguards to absolutely ensure its independence? And what more needs to be done, in your view, if, if it's not? Well, if, if I um, had my briefcase with me, which I don't, I just took a folder from the, the, the office desk with the speech in it. But in my briefcase, I have the ABC Act with me at all times. <laughs> um, in fact, I was giving a, a kind of town hall forum in Perth recently, and someone in the audience asked something about reference in the Act, and I said, look, I don't think that's what it actually says, and I went and plucked the Act out of my bag <laughs> and looked it up and said, no, it doesn't say that. What it says is I, I refer to the Act at least once a day, sometimes five or six times a day. The Act is remarkably robust, uh, and, in fact, it, it describes the duties of the ABC board um, in, in three, there, there are four sections that relate to the ABC board, but the duties. But the, the first three are the ones that really matter. The fourth goes into issues of which are not interesting. The first is that the ABC, the board must operate the ABC efficiently in the interests of all the Australian people. Second, that the board is responsible for the integrity and independence of the ABC. And third, that in the collection of news and information and dissemination of it, it must be done impartially according to commonly accepted standards of objective journalism. Um, I think there, and there are no qualifications to that. And interestingly, the editorial responsibilities of the ABC are not described in the Charter. They're actually direct legal impositions on the board itself. Something I remind journalists about when they get a bit huffy about me making remarks on journalism. And I say, that's my specific duty. And I make no apology for it. In my experience, all of six months, I get a sense of very general awareness and, and respect for the independence of the ABC in the parliament. I think sometimes that's through gritted teeth, but I think it is a very real phenomenon. And I think we've seen that over a long period of time where um, when governments are displeased with the ABC, the only resource in their kit bag is to punish it financially. But in any other way, there is nothing else available. I mean, governments have made some unusual board appointments, uh, at times multiple such appointments, and yet the organisation has managed to survive those experiences with a very strong adherence to independence and integrity. And I think if you think of the vast quantity of output of the ABC, its performance against those standards, whilst it can always be improved, is pretty damn good. Could they sack the board if they weren't as efficient? Well, that has happened. Uh, Mark experienced that. Mark had a board where the majority of the board were, let me say, um, Editorially minded in a single direction. <laughs> could I could I just add to that? You remarked on the importance of institutions, and I think they are vitally important to our democracy and the rule of law. Not just our media organisations, but um, our judicial ones too. I'm bringing the lawyer's perspective again here, but. Uh, you mentioned the politicisation of the Supreme Court in the US. Thank goodness that does not happen here. Um, one reason it happens over there is because of the appointment process, and there's this process for confirming Supreme Court appointments, which leads everyone to analyse the appointee's background and speculating on, on 
which way they're going to go on key legal issues. And thankfully that does not happen here. Um, the Supreme Court of New South Wales has just celebrated its bicentenary. 1824, it has survived since 1824 and is as strong as ever. Uh, and I think that's a real testament to the strength of our institutions uh, in this state and, and the country. Said, we're going to go question up the back here. I think, and then I'm going to come down to Gillian maybe to wrap. Hello there. Um, my name's Gillian Kilby. I'm a 2013 BHP Sir John Monash Scholar. And my question's for you, Zelly. Um, the Monash Foundation naturally provided a sliding door moment in my life where the education gave me the opportunity to come back and bring great benefit to Australia. One of my classmates at Stanford, um, Sophie Schmidt, started a business called Rest of World, which reports on how technology is impacting the world outside the Western bubble. And watching my classmate create this new journalism enterprise as the daughter of the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, was really empowering to see someone bring purpose before profit. And I believe the next Kim Williams will be a Monash scholar, someone who's had the opportunity to study at an incredible university and come back to Australia and make Australia great. And I absolutely could not take my eyes off you during your presentation. You are so articulate. You are so clever. Australia is so lucky to have you. You too, Kim. But Sally. <laughs> What is it about your Monash experience, the foundation support that has got you where you are now 14 years later? And thank you again for the time you both put into your presentations. Thank you. Um, it was a sliding doors moment for me too. Um, so as I said, I went to Cambridge, I did a master's in law with the support of the Monash Foundation. And there are a number of different ways in which an opportunity like that affects the future course of your life. So um, one thing is just the knowledge that you gain while you're over there. So I studied international and domestic human rights law and the fruits of that study uh, are still um, being demonstrated 14 years later. So the case that I mentioned Tickle and Giggle, I appeared for the Sex Discrimination Commissioner uh, to make submissions on points of law to assist the court. We took no position on whether discrimination had actually occurred. But uh, one of the arguments I met was that the gender identity discrimination provisions were unconstitutional because it was beyond Parliament's external affairs power to implement these gender identity discrimination provisions because they had no connection to any international human rights treaty or no sufficient connection. So I drew upon my human rights studies 14 years ago uh, to look at the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to look at the Convention of the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, uh, to build an argument that those provisions were actually implementing, they were appropriate and adapted to implementing that convention. So the first thing is the knowledge the second thing is, is the skills. Uh, so I wrote a thesis as part of my master's and just that ability to sit down and reflect on an issue deeply, which you often don't get to do as part of your undergraduate studies, um, trained me in writing, research, how to build an argument and put it persuasively, which has also borne through in my career as a barrister. And the third element, I think, uh, is the connections that you build. Uh, so you go to an institution like Cambridge, you meet experts from around the world who are leaders in their field, uh, and not only in law but in other fields because, of course, a cross-disciplinary approach is always so important when you're addressing the big issues. And a lot of those connections I maintain today, uh, and a lot of those connections have been fostered by the Monash Foundation when I returned from Cambridge. The foundation was especially good at bringing you into the fold, introducing you to other scholars, introducing you to people in your field and involving you in events like this so that you really do feel you're part of a network and part of a family. 
Jillian, did you have a final question? And then we'll take the last question. <laughs> Um, yes, it's a question for Kim. Uh, and um, I found your statistics, Kim, about the changing uh, habits of the community in terms of their sources of information and news are uh, very concerning, um, and particularly the younger generation, if I can refer to that cohort that you mentioned, and particularly, even amongst that, the number or the percentage from the, the study you mentioned who looked to TikTok as their main or if not sole source of news. Now, other countries, um, perhaps uh, those who do not value democracy, have banned uh, journalism and all that you have articulated as necessary for the pursuit of truth, the understanding of truth. Do you think democracies such as ours should ban, given, given the inevitable number slide that you've spoken of, should we ban organisations like TikTok because of its impact on our democracy and the inability of existing news organisations, other institutions to combat their lack of truth? Um, I, I don't think one resolve dilemmas by simply silencing people because I think it's an empty process. I don't think you can silence people in that way and I think it, 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 it proves to be counterproductive. TikTok is controversial, as you know. Um, Commonwealth public servants, Commonwealth authorities are not allowed to have TikTok on their phones. Um, I'm not allowed to have TikTok on my phone. Um, in fact, I, I received um, a lecture from a cabinet minister about the inappropriate nature of TikTok being on my phone. And I proceeded to remove it um, in that person's presence, um, only to find I was still getting TikToks because I'd removed it incompetently and I had to have the TikTok removal team come in and, and de-TikTok my phone. And at the ABC, all of the TikTok work that is done, and we do a lot of TikTok work, is done entirely in a, in a hermetically separate area um, and it is free from all other ABC technology. Um, it has its own servers, it has its own its own way of, of issuing the material because kids love TikTok. So my answer with TikTok is to propagate as much as much good stuff as you possibly can on TikTok. Rise to the challenge of producing better work. You know, my response to most things that are negative in life is to do better work. My response to most criticism is do better work. So I, I'm a great believer in just fighting back with better content. So last question, then we're going to let Kim and Zilly have their dinner. I'm going to do what a journalist couldn't, shouldn't do and ask a, a two-tiered question. Um, firstly, Kim, I think it's fantastic that you have uh, very clearly articulated what the ABC and a public broadcaster should be doing. Um, but I think that message goes mainly to people who under, already understand that, and I think we're all very relieved. A, a great many people in the society, I don't think, understand precisely the difference of a, an independent, publicly funded broadcaster who is truly independent. Um, but um, in order to lift the ABC to where it needs to be, which you have very clearly said, the elephant in the room is that there is going to be a need for quite a lot more funding, not a little bit. How, um, how can the general public and also members um, of the current government, aside from the Prime Minister and the Minister, be convinced that this is necessary and um, that funding to be um, perhaps safe for the future. And the second part of my question, which is really more for you, Zoe, is um, that 
the ABC exists because of the ABC Act, but should there ever be um, a hostile government in both the upper and the lower house, and we already know that one major party in the government wants to privatise the ABC, that would not be public broadcasting. Um, is there anything um, that can be done legally to safeguard the ABC in the interest of democracy? <laughs> start with the second part of the question. <laughs> um, anything that is created or given by statute can be taken away or altered by statute subject to the Constitution. So unless we can find somewhere implied in the Constitution protection for the ABC, it is vulnerable. <laughs> Um, of course, the High Court has recognised an implied freedom of political communication, which is not written in the Constitution, but was implied uh, by virtue of the fact that there is constitutional protection uh, for elections, and, and that was seen to be vital to fostering free and fair elections, whether an argument could be constructed along those lines that an institution like the ABC is, is vital to the freedom of political communication. I'll leave that for another day because I may or may not be briefed on one or other side of that <laughs> argument. I, I, be, uh, like everyone in the room, I'm a Bush lawyer. I'd say there are no such protections and we live in a democracy and democracies make laws. So there you go. Um, in terms of uh, the impact of advocacy, um, Clearly, you're all citizens. You're all entitled to make representations to local politicians. I can assure you, when Parliament's sitting, I'm in Canberra um, and I'm advancing a very assertive, private program of comprehensive advocacy presently. I would observe that I think I'm the first chairman to have done that for 36 years. I think it's a very good note to finish. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Zelly Heger and Kim Williams, two extraordinary Australians. Thank you very much. If you haven't met me, my name is Paul Ramage. Can you hear me there okay now? So, and, and for, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm CEO of the General Sir John Monash Foundation. I wanted to give a vote of thanks, and I wanted to begin by saying that I'm neither objective or impartial in giving these comments. I'm a former journalist. I'm with the John Monash Foundation. I have to talk about a John Monash scholar. I have to talk about journalism with him. And of course, with the CBA, they give John Monash scholarships and they're a host tonight. So forgive me for choosing this order, but I'm going to start with CBA. And could I just say, Andrew, you are so polished. 
the company is so polished in how you present and invite us to your headquarters, the way you speak, you speak, the way your staff treat us. It's a great credit to a great company. And could you please thank Andrew Hitchcliffe? Zelly, did you pay a John Monash scholar to give you that Dorothy Dixer? I thought it was superbly timed. It also reminded us of you as a person. You're a lawyer, you're a leading barrister, but you're clearly so much more. You're so articulate, you're so thoughtful, and you really shared with us, I think, some very important insights into the relationship between law and the media, and you were impeccable to give the response. Could you please thank Zelly? Kim Williams. What a grand sweep you took us through of history of John Monash, of the history of journalism, of the history of ideas. And you took us with a red thread across this journey to talk to us about the fundamental, fundamental elements of truth and knowledge and honesty. And it was an oration for the times. It was an oration of enormous quality. And I must say, it was arguably a unique oration when it came to tying together John Monash with media in the whole sense of what it means if you live a life like that. It was worthy of a chapter of a book, I'd have to say. But I do have to say to you, Kim Williams, if I bump into you in the street, I will expect you to pull out the full act for the ABC. I do want to know, did you also wash your hands after you deleted TikTok? And could I say on behalf of our chairman, Julian Siegel, the entire staff of the foundation, our supporters, how grateful we are to you for giving your time, for writing such a thoughtful oration on such an important matter. Could you please thank Mr. Kim Williams? As you would expect, uh, now I think, Zelly, you might have a gift already on your table, but if not, we do have one for you. But we do want to start with something very special for Kim. In, in 1996, famous illustrator and painter was commissioned to draw a sketch of John Monash for the $100 bill. It's still there, although the Monash family, in their own way, has asked for amendments over time. We were very lucky recently that a philanthropist purchased that original sketch and, and, and said to me in some sort of mate's talk, oh, Paul, would you like to mind this for a while? And I said, absolutely. And being an opportunist, I said, would, would it also be okay if, if I had uh, reproduction rights, please? And so uh, with one of my colleagues, could I please ask Kate to come up and may I please ask him to come up as well? We have a special uh, copy of the John Monash sketch for Mr. Kim Williams. Thank you. Thank you very much. 